Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. And uh, recently, a follower of my Facebook page, and there's a link to that in the description below if you'd like to uh, join up there and, and uh, chat with me. But a follower on the Facebook page asked us to make a video about uh, collisions, battleship-involved collisions, like what, what that looks like. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about a, a small medley of battleship collisions I can think of off the top of my head. Uh, nothing too in-depth, just a, a little look at, uh, hey, are these critical? What, what happens when battleships collide with other things? Um, so, first off, this is the Battle Con on an Iowa-class battleship, and... Uh, on account of all the armor, visibility isn't all that great. And we do have periscopes here that uh, allow the officer of the deck to look out of the top. Uh, that doesn't give you a particularly wide field of vision. So uh, because these battle cons are primarily where the ships are being navigated from, uh, and because of wartime conditions and uh, largely because battleships are just large and unmaneuverable, they do tend to hit some things. So th these that I know off the top of my head are uh, primarily World War II related and primarily U.S. Navy related. So uh, your first rule of the road is yield to tonnage. Always yield to tonnage. If you are in the smaller ship, you are likely faster and more maneuverable than the battleship. So if you find yourself uh, on a collision course with a battleship, it's up to you to get out of the way because we can't get out of our own way on this thing. So our first collision involves Battleship New Jersey. This took place on April 4th, 1945. So the fleet is maneuvering at night near uh, Okinawa. The fleet at this point is pretty much its maximum size. It is the whole big blue fleet in the Pacific. The war in Europe is just about over, so most of those ships have come over. Uh, and we haven't started to take severe attrition from kamikazes off Okinawa yet. So this is a huge fleet of ships maneuvering together in darkness. And they've got their lights out because it's wartime conditions. The carrier Yorktown was recovering night fighters. This was a relatively new innovation, but the ability to put radar on small carrier-based aircraft meant that uh, the U.S. Navy could put up fighter cover, uh, fighter screens in darkness. So Yorktown is recovering some of her night fighters, uh, which is something that starts right about at this date and continues on to the modern Navy, requires a tremendous amount of skill. And... Uh, because this is so dangerous and so new, the Yorktown had a destroyer trailing her. This was USS Franks. Franks is on what's called plane guard duty. So if something goes wrong and that aircraft trying to land on the carrier in complete darkness misses or otherwise has an accident and ends up in the ocean, Franks can hopefully pick them up because the carrier certainly can't maneuver and come around and pick them up. Uh, so the plane is recovered. It's late at night because this is difficult work. Franks' commanding officer, uh, David Richard Stephen, is in command of, he has the con of the ship, and he's tired. It's time for bed. Instead of doing what he's supposed to do, which is you slow down your ship and let the rest of the formation go past you, and then when you're outside of the circle, uh, you can go and regain whatever your position is in the formation. And typically, you've got your carriers and battleships at the center of the formation, and then your destroyers are forming a screen around it. So he's got to get across the formation to an outer edge where he's supposed to go. Now, instead of doing what he's supposed to do and, and taking his time and backing off, he decides to put on more speed and cut through the center of the formation at night under darkened ship. So he does that, and uh, it brings him in to the path of uh, the battleships that are escorting the carriers. And uh, in, in this instance, it's Battleship New Jersey. So uh, New Jersey, her lookouts actually see this destroyer perform this maneuver and come at them. 
I'm not sure how they were able to see it in complete darkness, but uh, apparently some really good lookouts. And uh, so New Jersey immediately does what she's supposed to do, turns on the running lights, um, and there's apparently enough time that they even ordered the electrician on the bridge to go and verify that the running lights are on, which means he turns the switch and he runs out to a bridge wing and looks and sees that there's lights and comes back in and reports that they're on. Uh, they sound their whistle, they uh, do all sorts of stuff you're not supposed to do under wartime steaming conditions, but that you do do to uh, avoid an accident. And um, he, the ship starts to maneuver away to try and avoid it, but you know, it's a battleship, it's not that easy. And of course you swerve out a line to try and avoid colliding with someone and now you're in somebody else's path, could cause a big 14 battleship pile up in the high seas. Uh, so they do everything they're supposed to do. Franks uh, sees what's happening and they start to maneuver and they have a uh, swipe with Franks basically comes across the bow of New Jersey and now they're going in opposite directions and they swipe each other side on. Now, interestingly, New Jersey's log barely records this incident at all. Uh, the ship sustained no damage, uh, might have needed some new paint. They just scrape side to side and New Jersey keeps on going, get, gets back in line and uh, continues as if nothing happened. On Franks, on the other hand, the uh, New Jersey's anchor overhanging the side of the ship so the anchor rips off uh, Franks' bridge wing, a searchlight position, a gun position, does a lot of other topside damage to the destroyer. The two officers on the bridge wing, Commander Steven and uh, another officer, I think it was the navigating officer off the top of my head, jump from the bridge wing when it's about to be ripped off. Uh, the junior officer lands inside the flag bag and is relatively safe. The flags provided some cushion. Commander Stevens dropped about two levels to the main deck, uh, broke a rib, and it punctured a lung. He is transferred. The Franks pulls out of the formation and goes and joins the refueling group. Uh, they do not have the medical facilities on board to take care of Commander Steven, uh, so he is transferred to an oiler. Um, and that oiler does not have good enough facilities on board either and he dies two days later on April 6th, 1945. This is what happens when you ignore your normal operating procedures, uh, and unfortunately in this instance he paid for it with his life. Um, fortunately nobody else was hurt and the ship was able to be repaired and sent back to the front relatively quickly and, and then go on to serve for another couple of decades. And New Jersey didn't suffer any damage or even know that any of this happened. Uh, her, her log specifically mentions no casualties. So that is New Jersey's big collision that we're aware of. Of course, the most famous collision involving an Iowa-class battleship takes place on May 6th, 1956, and this is between the Iowa-class battleship USS Wisconsin and the destroyer USS Eaton. Eaton is doing something similar, acting as plane guard for an American carrier in the formation the carrier radios man overboard. So the destroyer swerves out of formation and in heavy fog cuts in front of Wisconsin. Now, unfortunately, uh, there was no man overboard. This ended up being a false report. This didn't need to happen. Um, but somebody spotted something in the water and uh, decided it was better to be safe than sorry and announce a man overboard. So the ship that was supposed to deal with that shears out of formation. Uh, and in this instance, despite having radar and sailing under peacetime conditions, um, in the heavy fog, the two ships don't see each other and Wisconsin collides with Eaton. The bows of American battleships, especially uh, the fast battleships, are completely unarmored. That is where the thinnest shell plating is. And uh, so Wisconsin had a huge destroyer-sized chunk taken out of her nose and the Navy decided that the easiest thing to do would be to crop out that whole section and replace it with the incomplete bow of USS Kentucky. This makes Wisconsin um, now USS Whiskey, Wisconsin, Kentucky. Um, we did another video on this where we go into a little bit more depth. There's a link to that in the description below. It's kind of an older video. Um, please ignore how uncomfortable I am and how bad the sound is and everything else. We'll, we'll probably come back to it in the future. 
but in this you can see that USS Eaton's superstructure and hull is completely chewed up. Uh, and fortunately both ships were able to uh, stay afloat and go back to, I think it was Norfolk, near where they were operating, and get repaired. Uh, so again, if you're in the smaller ship and you don't yield the tonnage, you're going to have more damage done to you than uh, you do to the other ship. Now, uh, because battleships operate in groups, they're supposed to operate in a line of battle. That's why they're called battleships, they're line of battle ships. Um, and this line of battle is usually somewhere between a quarter mile and a mile of spacing, which ends up not being a whole heck of a lot of time uh, for ships that require all this maneuverability. You see a lot of battleship on battleship collisions. And two real famous ones I can think of that involve the US Navy are USS Oklahoma hitting USS Arizona. This took place on October 22nd, 1941. And this put both ships in dry dock for the last time before they're destroyed during the attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, so this is the incident that leads to Arizona being dry docked and getting the alterations that change her to what she looks like during the attack on Pearl Harbor, the radar platform on top of the forward tripod and the three inch gun tubs. And it's probably when she is repainted, although we have no idea what color to, whether it was blue or gray. There's another video in the description below where we uh, talk about this, how strange it is that we don't even know what color Arizona was when she was lost. But um, basically, Arizona is the flagship of Battleship Division 1, with Oklahoma behind her and Nevada behind that. Uh, and they are maneuvering during battle practice right before America enters the war. And uh, something goes wrong and Arizona doesn't maneuver with the rest of the fleet, whether because she's the fleet flagship and uh, Nevada and Oklahoma do what another battle group's doing, or because Arizona is slow in doing it. Uh, th these maneuvers are difficult, which is why they practice them. But in this instance, Oklahoma ends up colliding with Arizona straight on, like basically amidships. I think it was frame 75 off the top of my head, and, and pretty much nose to uh, broadside. And this rips open a couple of uh, spaces in the blister. It does a little bit of damage to Oklahoma. These old battle wagons are moving pretty slow though, so it's not too significant. I think Arizona takes on like a two or three degree list, nothing too bad. And they go back to port and they're fixed and they're all ready for war on December 7th. So sometimes when battleships collide, there's no major damage and it's easily reparable. The maybe most famous collision between American battleships takes place on February 1st, 1944, and this is between the battleships Washington and Indiana. Indiana's captain um, radios that they are turning to port and then uses what's called the seaman's eye, his best judgment as a 20-year naval professional, and decides that, in fact, to maintain formation, he needs to turn to starboard. This ends up being a misjudgment, and he turns into the path of USS Washington directly behind him. Uh, the, the fleet is operating under work time conditions at speed. Washington's officer of the deck does absolutely everything they're supposed to and in fact receives a commendation for um, the effort he does to try and avoid the collision and reducing its impact. But uh, Washington hits Indiana pretty close to the stern and then keeps swiping. Uh, and so that ends up grinding off something like the forward 70 feet of Washington, most of the bow of the ship, and then the main deck just like drops in front of it. It causes all sorts of damage. She has to have a whole new bow built at Puget Sound. Uh, Indiana uh, comes pretty close to sinking. Washington rips up such a big hole in the backside of the ship that uh, it took some Herculean damage control efforts to keep her afloat, get her back to Pearl Harbor. And both of these ships are returned to the war within probably about three months, which is pretty spectacular considering the amount of damage. But, uh, so there, there is a little medley of what happens when battleships collide with things. Um, there are, of course, some instances of pre-dreadnought battleships, particularly in the Royal Navy, where collisions lead to the loss of the ship. There's no such incidents in the U.S. Navy. Uh, so typically, uh, at least in, in the American Navy, when these ships collide, there, there isn't any fatal damage done, although Indiana comes close. 
So uh, again, this was a question that somebody posted on my Facebook page. If you're interested in joining that page and interacting with me, there's a link in the description below. There's also a link down there where you can donate to the museum to support uh, the museum and our YouTube channel. You can also support us by liking, sharing, and subscribing so more people find out about us. We also receive operating support from the New Jersey Department of State. Thanks for watching.